Good morning and welcome to this, the 17th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off or on airplane mode, please? Um, we have no apologies this morning and Linda Fabiani will be joining us in the course of the meeting. Um, her, our first agenda item this morning is a continuation, in fact the last um, oral evidence session of our inquiry into uh, the harassment of uh, children and young people in schools, a school bullying uh, inquiry. Um, the purpose of this final session is to hear from the Cabinet Secretary this morning. As you know, we have heard um, much evidence over the past uh, months on this topic, um, and this will be the final evidence session, as I said, but we're really keen to hear from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I welcome uh, John Swinney, who's the Deputy First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Education Skills in the Scottish Government, and Fiona Page, who's the Head of Support and Wellbeing Unit in the Scottish Government, Learning Directorate, and welcome back Maggie Fallon, who's a Senior Education Officer for Education Scotland. Good morning and, and welcome to committee. We're very grateful that you could give us your time this morning. We have many... Uh, quite searching questions on this very uh, um, uh, sensitive topic, but we're really keen to hear from you all this morning, especially you, Deputy First Minister, and I believe you have a brief opening statement. Uh, yes, Convener, if I can make a brief uh, opening statement, I welcome the opportunity to confirm to the committee the Government's uh, approach in relation to this important issue. I, I'd like to make it absolutely clear that the Government considers bullying of any kind to be completely unacceptable. And wherever it occurs, we have a responsibility to take action to deal with it quickly and effectively. The government believes there is no place in Scotland for prejudice or discrimination and that everyone deserves to be treated fairly. We must tackle prejudice and discrimination and promote equality and diversity, and this work must, must begin early within our school system. We have made absolutely clear the commitment of this government to improving children's health and well-being and their learning opportunities. We want all children and young people to learn the importance of tolerance, respect and good citizenship to stamp out prejudice in our society and to build the foundations of strong, healthy relationships founded on inclusion and equality. The starting point for developing this is in our schools and early learning settings. That is why anti-bullying policy should be at the heart of the whole school approach, driven by strong leadership to create a positive and inclusive learning environment which promotes learning and welcomes and values diversity. It is vital that all anti-bullying approaches promote effective action wherever bullying occurs, as we must recognise the harm and damage that it causes. And that is why this government is refreshing the national approach to anti-bullying, to highlight the, the impact of prejudice-based bullying and identify how all organisations, including schools and youth organisations, can respond appropriately, an issue which underpins and informs all of the work of our national anti-bullying service, Respect Me. I am aware that as part of your inquiry into bullying, you have taken evidence from a wide range of people and organisations, and I look forward to receiving the committee's conclusions on this work. As the committee will be aware, I have um, held back the publication and finalisation of our uh, review of the national approach to anti-bullying until I see the committee's work, and I will reflect very closely and carefully on that work when it is published. Um, evidence tells us that investing time and resources into improving relationships and behaviour in schools leads to improved health and wellbeing, better attainment, inclusion and engagement, and stronger communities and cohesion in the longer terms. Uh, committee will, members will be aware that I recently established the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group to work with the Thai campaign to develop an improved approach to inclusion in our schools. The first meeting of this group took place on the 9th of May, and I look forward to receiving the group's recommendations in due course. As part of the mental health strategy, the Government has also committed to a review of personal and social education, which will also consider the role of pastoral guidance in local authority schools and services for counselling for children and young people in our schools. This review is currently developing its scope and I am keen for its work to be progressed. Um, I look forward to working with the committee to identify what more we can do to stop bullying and to improve inclusiveness in our schools in Scotland. Deputy First Minister, the we, we, the committee is actually very grateful that, that when we took evidence in November, we had a round table evidence with a lot of the young people who had raised some concerns about anti-bullying strategies and how they work and, and maybe they, their input into that. And I think we were very grateful when uh, you uh, delayed the, the publication of the strategy to allow the committee to, to, to take some very in-depth work on this. And we have done that both on the record and off the record, for, because for some young people the issues were so sensitive and, and so painful that we had to do some off-the-record work as well. But we have the permission of some of those young people to make reference to, to their evidence too, so uh, that's very, very helpful. The key element to all of this um, 
seemed to be for young people was the impact on them as an individual and on their, their, their family and their community as well. One of the aspects I think that, that we will look at in, in a report very clearly would, will be the impact on the health and wellbeing of those young people. And as you know, it's one key pillar of uh, Curriculum for Excellence. Um, we had a young woman who, who told us that she wanted education and healthy relationships, and not just healthy relationships, but healthy friendships. And I know that's a key element of the work and the strategy and the work that Respect Me is doing. And I think for us, we would be pushing uh, an all-government approach on this. So this is not just an education issue, it's a public health issue as well, because the impact on those young people as they move on out into adult life seems to be very, very profound. Now, I suppose uh, we agree with you and our evidence seems to agree with you and all of the young people that we have spoken to have agreed as well that the earlier the intervention, the better. So I think my question to you is how do we implement at the earliest stage, even maybe at preschool and primary school, to ensure that there, there is clear understanding from young people about what bullying is, the impact that it has, where they can go for help, whether teachers are equipped to do that help, and very, very importantly, whether they understand consent, which seemed to be another key element of why people felt bullied. Um, so I've just chucked all of that <laughs> at you, and hopefully you maybe have some answers, and then we've got some details that each committee member will go into individually. Uh, I, th I think the, the, the fundamental point, Kavina, which I um, accept, is that the earlier the intervention takes place, the better. And that intervention should not, in my view, um, only be reactive intervention when a problem arises. The intervention should be proactive, and that is fundamentally about the ethos that is enshrined in Curriculum for Excellence and the ethos that underpins our whole approach to the development of um, education in its broadest sense within uh, our early learning and schools settings. Um, Curriculum for Excellence is founded on the um, the, 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 uh, on the values that we want young people to reflect. So those values that I went through in my opening statement about tolerance, about respect, uh, about respecting difference, these are all values that are enshrined in the approach that we take in Curriculum for Excellence. So that's the point I make about the necessity of us not just looking at this as a reactive measure. It has to be something where we are, from the earliest possible ages, encouraging young people to behave with respect towards others and as a consequence of that to um, to develop the type of healthy relationships and friendships that will mitigate against the emergence of bullying. However, you know, I, I, I also live in the real world and I realise that there will be incidents that will happen which will cause great distress to individuals. And you, you said, convener, in your comments that the point that had come out of the evidence from young people was about and the, the striking point, and this is the point which I think is inescapable, um, is that uh, bullying has an impact on individual young people. And that is what matters. So that is what has to be rectified. Uh, it has to be. Um, so we, we can take all the steps that I've set out about early intervention and prevention and creation of good practice and good relationships. But where bullying um, actually happens, we have to make sure that young people are alert to the support that's available to them, that they know, first of all, that bullying is wrong. So they should be able to go to somebody to help them, realising this is wrong. So that's part of, again, back to my early intervention um, commentary, that young people need to know this is a bad thing and they are entitled to get help to address it and that help must be available and invariably that will be in the um, well it has to be addressed within the early learning or school setting that a young people young person is um, is, is operating and I think crucially we have to make sure that those who are likely to be delivering the support to young people are well equipped to deliver that and that's where the importance of having the correct approach in initial teacher education to equip professionals with the capacity to be able to provide the support that young people require is a really important part of the, the work that we have to do. Thanks very much.
Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned in your comments the mental health strategy and the new strategies just, <coughs> just published, and there's very welcome uh, aspects of that uh, target young people and, and, and their, their journey through, through school. Can you tell me how the new strategy would maybe link up with the mental health strategy and in order that they work together? And I go back to my point about this being almost an all-government approach um, and, and, its, and its essence, um, and how, how would the two strategies then work together to resolve the situation? Well, there's a, there's a number of elements that will come together here. There will be um, the mental health strategy, there will be the anti-bullying strategy, there will be the relationships approach that we take, there will be the approach on personal and social education. And what the government has to make sure, and what I assure the committee is uppermost in the mind of ministers as we work across government in this respect, is that we have the same common themes and attitudes that are, that, are, that are percolating their way through all of these different elements. And that, um, uh, that is an important aspect of ensuring consistency between these different approaches. And fundamentally, they are anchored in what is the, 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 the foundations of government uh, policy towards young people, which is getting it right for every child. Uh, which again links back to the comment that you made in your early remarks, convener, that the impact of bullying is felt on individual young people. So getting it right for every child must focus us on addressing the issues that affect every young person. And we have to make sure that we have that focus in all of our policy interventions that enable us to do so. Thank you very much. Mary Fee. Convener, and good morning, um, good morning. Cabinet Secretary. Um, one, one of the things that's focused in almost every evidence session that we've had on this is the guidance that's available in schools. And I have, I suppose, a bit of a bee in my bonnet about guidance, because guidance is required, it's necessary and it's good. But what I don't want is guidance that sits on a shelf and is taken down once every six months, once every year, dusted down, read and put back on the shelf. Um, and, and I understand changes have been made or will be made to the guidance and there will be regular refreshes of, of, of the guidance. And the point that you made in your earlier answer to um, the convener about the ethos of the curriculum for excellence, and, and it's, it's my belief there should be an ethos in schools that's supportive, that's understanding, that tackles bullying and understands how children, children actually feel. And we heard evidence um, last week from a school in Kirkcaldy that has developed that very ethos in the school, um, works with the pupils in the school, has pupil councils, pupils mentor, pupils support each other. So, and I'm conscious I'm flinging, as the convener did, flinging a lot at you in, in, in my question, but, but how do you make sure that the, the guidance in schools is actually a living document? And how do you support schools to develop that ethos that we heard about last week? I think the, the, the answer to this is deeply enshrined in the approach of curriculum for excellence and the aspiration to have inclusive schools. Mm -hmm. So the example that Mary Fee cites of Kirkcaldy High School is, is I, I've mm -hmm. visited Kirkcaldy High School, I'm familiar with the approach to the school and I understand very clearly from my conversations both with mm -hmm. the rector but also with senior pupils how that is brought to life within mm -hmm. the school and it can only be brought to life within individual schools. I take another example at the other end of the country. I was recently visiting Elgin Academy, and Elgin Academy has developed a model where the school library is essentially a place of inclusion, safety, and welcome for anybody mm. who is perhaps feeling mm. not safe and not included. It's presided over by a, a very welcoming, supportive librarian who has led a process of engaging senior pupils in the school to um, provide that mentoring and nurturing support mm. to more vulnerable younger pupils so that their journey through the school is a happier journey than it might have been without that intervention. So fundamentally, and it's like this is no different to any of the challenges that I face mm. because we have two and a half thousand schools around the mm. country, it is about getting those values and that practice enshrined within schools. My observation is that I think the if we were to go into any school in the country and say to the head teacher, are you trying to run an inclusive school? The answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. 
there will be varying degrees of success and of course I think one of the key points, and this is at the heart of some of the reforms that I'm proposing around education, is to make sure that some of the outstanding practice, such as the practice the committee has heard of from Kirkcaldy High School, can be more widely understood within the system so that other schools can aspire to deliver that. And I totally accept the point that Mary Fee makes to me about um, guidance not sitting on a shelf. There's no point of that mm. because the guidance has got to be brought to life to make sure that young mm. people experience the type of education system that this guidance aspires to deliver. And I certainly um, recognise the importance of ensuring young people are included and feel involved in their school and feel safe in their school for the reasons that the Kavina cited in her own question, because it's important for every single young person that they feel like that. Nobody should not feel like that. But it's also critical for attainment, because young people are unlikely to attain their full potential if they're not happy, safe and included in their schools. So for, for every reason, there's no reason, there's no reason to counter the sentiment that's been put to me in the question. Um, but our challenge is to make sure that's replicated in operational practice in schools around the country. And, and I know from um, speaking to, um, to teachers, and I've had a number of conversations with um, teachers, that not in, not in every school, but, but you'll find in schools there are some teachers that are, are very keen, very enthusiastic, and want to perhaps not change the way they do things, but, but work in a more um, inclusive manner and, and work with pupils. And, and again, in some schools, there are teachers who are very traditional and, and don't want to move away from a, a very kind of rigid set of, of guidelines. Um, and, and one of the other things that, that we heard about when we took evidence was the amount of training that's given to teachers when they're actually doing their teacher training on recognising bullying and, and how we can tackle it and what the signs that you should look, look out for. Do you think that now is the time to, to change the way we teach teachers about recognising bullying and how to handle it and strategies that they should use when they become teachers? Um, yes, I think that it is important that initial teacher education mm -hmm. reflects the values and aspirations that uh, are set out in, in, in the question. I think I'd also want to say that Scottish education, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Mary Fee will recognise this, has changed very significantly. And the type of inclusive nurturing environment that I'm setting out, I now see very frequently across the education system. And some very good work has been done to make sure that the support is available within schools to overcome the challenges that young people will face and therefore, as a consequence, make them feel more included within individual schools. So I think the, the, the necessity is to ensure that initial teacher education does equip teachers with those capacities. But it's also important that we recognise the, the, the changes and the further need for change within our school system to make sure that those values are reflected in the experience of young people. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Cabinet Secretary, can I just pick up on one point on teacher training? And one of the other aspects that we're looking at is, is CPD of, of already trained teachers. Uh, and I suppose, coming from the, the, the social work professional background I came from, there was a number of uh, CPD training that was compulsory. And whether that would be a length that you would go to to ensure that, that teachers um, who are attending CPD sessions get those CPD, the CPD sessions for a start, but actually turn up as well. Because some of the evidence that we have heard um, is that the, the training is available, but some teachers just don't take it. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, where we've seen some poor practice, that's where that's been evident. So there's a, there's a clear connection there between, you know, uh, continuous professional development and the uptake of that, and whether maybe the government would go as far to recommend it, that should be compulsory. The committee will recognise that in the proposals that I set out to Parliament on Thursday, there is a very heavy emphasis on continuous professional development and the enhancement of learning and teaching within the education system. And that, that is the purpose behind the regional collaboratives that uh, I have proposed. Because I want to make sure that the type of quality interventions to enhance learning and teaching and to enhance the quality of our schools is available systemically within Scottish education. So I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that type of approach. The committee will, of course, be aware that 
in the guidance that was issued to the education system in August of last year by the Chief Inspector of Education, I'm just, um, uh, yes, it would be in the August guidance, um, we identified within the eight curricular areas within Curriculum for Excellence, literacy, numeracy and health and well-being were capacities that had to be, that were more important than okay. the others, if I can put it like that. Okay. And the purpose of that was to make it expressly clear to the education system the importance of focusing on enhancing health and well-being mm -hmm. Um, along with literacy and numeracy, to make sure that young people have got the strongest and most most secure foundations they can have in meeting their um, their aspirations. Okay, th thank you. Any bills? Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Thank you, Convener. Um, my sort of a question is: when we take into consideration prejudice-type bullying, such as race and religion, how will the national strategy be localised in places like Glasgow, where it has fifty percent of the the Muslim population, how do we how are we going to make sure that we've got a localised strategy where, ne where needed? Again, I come back to the reforms that I was setting out on th last Thursday, and it's also similar to the point I made to Mary Fee, that fundamentally this is about what goes on in, a, in an individual school. And the profile of a school in the centre of Glasgow is going to be very different mm -hmm. to the profile of a school in Ms Ross's constituency, very different. So we have to make sure that the approach that is taken forward is um, tailored to meet the needs of young people in that circumstance. But fundamentally, whether it's bullying because of relationship issues in a school in rural Scotland, or whether it's bullying because of um, racial prejudice in a school in central Glasgow, in either situation it's totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So the the, the bullying the anti-bullying strategy will establish those principles, those values that whatever it takes, whatever whatever shape whatever shape it takes, whatever form it takes, whatever location it takes, it's not on. And therefore we have to make sure that schools are tailoring their own individual response to meet those requirements in different localities within the country. And that's where I want to see head teachers able to lead that process within their schools as effectively as we possibly mm -hmm. can do. Can I just come in with another question? We were just talking about Kirkcaldy High School and it was sort of a, when the, the head teacher was in last week, he'd said that he had replaced three quarters of the teaching staff and that helped to create an inclusive school. So he had to replace three quarters of the teaching staff to get there, to get it right. So my sort of a question is, how do we make sure we've got the right teachers and the right jobs to so that we have got an inclusive school and we can take those steps forward? We need to have good leadership that makes it clear that it, uh, the, the, the creation of inclusive schools is what matters to us. And that's certainly that leadership exists within government and it, uh, I know it exists within local authorities and we have to make sure it exists right through our school system. Uh, but some of the other issues that we've talked about already about initial teacher education are significant in helping to essentially get the new teaching population off on the right footing. Uh, but the issues the convener raised with me about continuous professional development are also mm -hmm. important to make sure, again going back to Mary Fee's point to me, that this is not some abstract guidance that's mm -hmm. in a filing cabinet, that this is actually part of the living, breathing values of the school and that teachers are identifying how they can contribute towards that environment as a consequence of the delivery of their professional practice. Thank you very much. Gail Ross. Thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you talked about the, the updated guidance for um, PSE in schools, which is absolutely welcome and, and very important. Um, I just want to go um, back to what Annie Wells was saying about uh, faith-based um, bullying. And we do know that a lot of bullying and, and prejudice in society as a whole comes from um, a, a fear of somebody being perceived as different or a lack of understanding in their beliefs and their culture. Um, what are we doing to make sure that um, different religions are not just supported but taught about so that um, pupils understand what different religions believe in? Well, of course, 
Um, religious and moral education um, is a, a, a taught subject within the curriculum. So the, there is an importance and a recognition of the necessity to educate young people about the breadth of religious practice uh, and involvement so that there is an understanding of those different characteristics. And I think that's one element of the approach that, that we have to take to make sure that young people are equipped with that knowledge. But they are also, they must also be able to set that knowledge within the context of their wider educational experience, which has to be in an inclusive environment where we are respectful of difference and diversity within the education system. So I think it's very important that there is that understanding, but it's set within that context of how we behave towards each other and behave in a fashion that is respectful of difference and not intolerant of difference. As I said in the question, a lot of this prejudice that the kids, it's not just in a school setting, and I realise that we're talking about education. Is there anything that schools can do to work with the wider communities to try and, and you know, promote that inclusiveness? Yes, and I, I, I think there's a lot that can be done there because I, I think all of the learning tells us and the evidence that there is much can, that can be achieved within our schools. Lots can be achieved within our schools, but not everything can be achieved within our schools. So the relationships between schools and communities are very, very important. And how those relationships are uh, struck and structured is, is critical. So the, the ethos that we try to encourage within our schools is for them to be involved in, in, in the communities of which they are a part. Now, if I, I saw some work in my own constituency where pupils in schools are out, for example, um, active involved in delivery of services and activities within care homes for the elderly. So these young people are experiencing how it is to, to, to work and support with vulnerable elderly people in care homes and to provide some, well, from what I saw, an awful lot of joy to the um, elderly members of our society. Now that's just one example about how schools can make a profound contribution to our communities, but that experience can also be of profound benefit to the young people themselves. And that again is part of reinforcing the ethos of an inclusive society, a respectful society, who are respectful in the example I've just cited, to um, elderly members of our society. And, and that would apply to a whole variety of different groups within our society. So I think there are many ways in which our schools can reach out beyond their, um, their boundaries to be actively involved in communities and to create the right ethos uh, that supports that. Thanks. Um, obviously, coming from a really rural constituency myself, um, we don't have the rich mixture of faiths like, as you said, you would get in Annie Wells um, or, or other constituencies um, uh, in the Central Belt and other places. Um, Interfaith Scotland had a stand, and I was speaking to um, a, representative, a representative from from there um, a couple of days ago, and it's it could be quite. It can be quite challenging for, for teachers in rural schools if, and, and this sounds, if somebody has never met someone of another faith, how do you understand, mm -hmm. you know, just by sitting in the classroom alone? How, how do you make that learning experience more interactive, if you like? There's, there's two points I, I'd, I'd make here. I think there's, as I, I, like Scotland is changing as a country before our eyes, and you know, when I look at the um, the population mix in my son's primary school in Blairgowrie, in rural Scotland, a significant proportion of my son's primary class are children from families who have come to Scotland very recently, uh, many from Eastern Europe, now very much part of our community. But the, the, the class is a very diverse population base, even within rural Scotland. So I think that diversity 
is something which means that the approach that we take must be must reach all parts of the country because there will be all sorts of different diversity in all sorts of different parts of Scotland and it will have different character about it. The second point is about the experience of ensuring that young people have the knowledge of different religious practice and experience so that they can be equipped to handle that as effectively as possible. And that's where religious and moral education is, is an important part of schooling. But it's also important that the school, in trying to ensure that young people are able to receive that breadth of experience and um, an appreciation of diversity uh, are able to understand the differences that exist between different denominations and different religious traditions in order that uh, they may be able to live out the values of respect that uh, we all want to see lived out in our schools. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'm just going to ask you one more question, and it's probably going to be quite a difficult one to answer, but um, I feel like I would be letting the young person down if I didn't ask it. We took some quite harrowing evidence on Tuesday um, from a, a young disabled um, woman that was in a wheelchair, and she told us about several very, very distressing episodes in her school, and they were not perpetrated by the pupils, but unfortunately uh, by the teachers. And um, to, to put it in, an, in a nice way, the teachers were either unsympathetic or dismissive of her um, problems and issues. Um, and to put it bluntly, um, she told us that the teachers actually added to her distress by making her feel worthless and that she actually deserved that the way she was being treated. Um, she took it to the local authority and uh, was also um, unfortunately dismissed at that level as well. Um, we talk about how we punish children for um, t uh, treating other children in this way at school. How do we deal with teachers that act like that? Obviously, I, I don't, I've not been cited on the, the, the case that, that's, that's been raised, but I come back to the, the fundamental point that I made in my opening remarks in response to the convener, that there is no circumstance in which bullying is acceptable, and, and there is no circumstance in which bullying perpetrated by any individual is less significant or less concerning than another. So whether it's um, uh, whether it's about the the way in which individuals have acted in perpetrating that bullying or in not properly investigating and holding it to account is, in my view, not acceptable. That would be completely at odds with the aspirations of our approach in this respect. Uh, obviously, if there are if there are specific details, I, I'm very happy to, to pursue those and to identify and satisfy myself that everything that needs to be done to address those concerns is properly addressed. And I'll, I'll certainly be very happy to do that um, if the committee wishes to bring that to me. Uh, but I would say that we have to make sure that in our professional standards and in what is expected of, of teachers, and these are implicit parts of the professional standards of teachers to properly and fully um, uh, respect and implement the guidance that we are setting out, uh, that those issues of professional practice um, can be addressed as part of the, um, uh, the uh, approach that we take. Now, fundamentally, um, at the heart of this issue will be an issue of children's rights, and it is critical in our society that the rights of children are respected and one of the most important rights about children is their ability to express their concerns and to have their concerns addressed. And as a society, we must be prepared without fear or favour to do exactly that. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> and again, thank you for coming along this morning. I think it may be slightly naively before I started this inquiry with the committee, I hadn't appreciated maybe the where we are in Scotland. And I think we've learned that all five protected characteristics have some form of bullying going on in some of our schools. 
And as the convener said, some of the stories that we have heard over the last few months have been quite harrowing. Um, I, I wonder if I can ask two questions. And let me caveat my question by saying, firstly, I was a local councillor, so I appreciate that there's a, a local authority that you have to deal with in Causeloo and, and, and all that. And I'll come on to that in a moment. And secondly, let me say that I, I, I am totally convinced you and y y your government is completely committed to you to the strategy of getting rid of anti-bullying. But I think the question that I have is, how do we implement what y your fine words and good words, and I take them absolutely generally, how do we then get that down to the P2 classroom across Scotland or the S4 classroom? And I think for me, there's, a, there's, there's still a disjoint between what comes from government and local authorities and actually what happens on the ground in a local school. And, and one of the things that has, I think, surprised me is the, the, the lack of recording that goes on. And um, we've heard evidence that either head teachers or, or teachers are, are scared to record actual incidents of bullying because they, they don't want to be seen as a school that has racial bullying or sexual bullying or whatever. I, I suppose my question is, how do we get around that? And can we add it to part of the inspection of the school that they give a robust account for we've had no bullying in the last five years in our school? I think I the, it's a very big question as well. I yeah, apologise for that. The, uh, no, no, the, um, fundamentally, I suppose the answer is in leadership. That, And this comes back to Mary Fee's point. It's all very well having the guidance documents, but if they're, if they're, if they're not actually living, breathing parts of the system, then they're not really much use. So it's all about leadership. And um, I demonstrate the leadership that the government uh, takes on this issue. I am certain that the 32 local authority leaders and directors of education will uh, support that direction because the you know, there's no way any of the directors of education or leaders of council will take a uh, will take a different view from me about the unacceptability of bullying in our schools, and uh, I'm certain that um, the success of our measures uh, will depend significantly on the way we can deploy that education uh, that, that leadership and to make sure that it's felt in the schools around Scotland. And ultimately, we we have to rely, for all aspects of our school practice, on the strength of the work that is undertaken within schools and the strength of leadership that's deployed. And that's not just about head teachers; it's about individual classrooms, because there's a classroom approach here. And Mr. Balfour makes exactly the the, the right point. Um, and um, the 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 whole nature of leadership in, in, in our system is crucial to the success of our approach on education. So that, that, that's my principal answer to how we get this percolating its way through the system. I think in relation to the question of recording, that's an issue that's um, very specific and very material, and I'm considering that question, and obviously I'll listen carefully to what the committee is part of, part of why I've not gone to publication of a strategy is I wanted to listen to what the committee had to say to me about this this question because I think these these are issues which uh, transcend uh, party political considerations so I'm interested in what the, the views of the committee will be in this respect. I think we've got to be, um, I think that some of the dilemmas are included in Mr Balfour's question that no school will want to be um, in a sense require, acquire a reputation for being a school that has a problem with bullying but equally, a school will want to be able to take the necessary action to tackle the issue, and that's what matters. Now, in relation to um, inspection, uh, the, the issues around bullying can, I would expect, to be considered with an inspection. So inspectors, when they go into school, will have discussions with young people. Uh, they will be open discussions. The inspectors attach a very significant emphasis to the quality of those discussions and the privacy of those discussions with young people. And I certainly know from my own experience, you know, when I go into schools, I'm talking to P2 
pupils and teachers. I'm doing that in uh, in private space where they can tell me it as it is. And inspectors will do exactly the same thing into the bargain. So there's a um, these issues will be um, very much central to the approach to inspection that is taken uh, by uh, Her Majesty's Inspector of Education. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, I suppose my, my second question again, it's, it, it's a very big question, so I'm just really throwing it out there. But I think one of the concerns I and maybe others on the committee have is that there is good work being done by Respect Me, there's good work being done by Scottish Government, there's good work being done by Causley, there's good work being done by Education Scotland. But how do we link them all together so we don't end up with lots of people doing a wee bit of work in their wee area? And, and we miss the kind of big strategic role, which then percolates down. And I, I'm not saying we get rid of any of these organisations. I think we all have a role to play with it. But my slight fear is that is the left hand talking to the right hand, which uh, is a problem for me. Y yes, I, 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 I acknowledge the importance of making sure that we have a focused approach to the delivery of this work within Scotland. But Frankly, that's no different to a myriad of other issues where we need cohesive action to deliver within our education system. So it's for those reasons that I've come to the conclusion that we need to have um, a much more focused approach generally in education to delivering improvement and uh, performance strengthening within our schools, which is why I've set out the proposals that I set out last Thursday on the regional collaboratives, because I do think we need more cohesion in this work. So that's a, that, that's another reason why I think the reforms that I announced last week are important to give us the mechanisms and the approaches to ensure that we can be more confident that the improvements in practice that we've talked about uh, will actually be deployed across the board within our education system. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and good morning to the panel. It's good to see you all again, and thank you for coming to see us. Um, I have a couple of areas I'd like to cover. Um, there's been a bit of discussion in this session about, in this meeting today, about the need to foster an understanding in children of what healthy relationships look like as a means of preventing bullying and uh, fostering a culture of respect um, and resilience in schools. And, and that really struck me, actually, because for two years I served on the Ministerial Task Force on Child ex Sexual Exploitation um, in, in a previous life. And very much uh, the same approach was adopted in that regard as well, that an understanding of what healthy relationships look like was a means of stopping exploitative relationships and bullying as a form of exploitation. Um, it struck me on that group that I was the youngest member of that group, and that itself presented a barrier in the sense that we had an inference and, or a belief as to what was happening on the ground in schools, but actually um, that, that was often wide of the mark. And it struck me that also that forums in which child sexual exploitation can take place can also be those in which bullying can take place. And that's online forums and particularly around online abuse. And I just wondered, in terms of your work, Cabinet Secretary, um, in this area, what um, steps have you taken to enlist young people to mine them for intelligence about where the, the newest fora are for in which bullying might take place or um, the, the sort of strata and the, the means by which it might take place, which we might remember when we were at school, but is very, very different to the sort of theatres in which this might happen nowadays? Well, the world has changed significantly since I was certainly at school, so there's uh, there's a world of a difference there. I, I, this is a very important issue, and it's about the engagement of young people in the process of policy formulation. And we are, I think, going through a really positive journey of changing that within government. Um, if I give one example, uh, I was at the Education Committee a couple of uh, a little while ago. And Ross Greer asked me, I was talking about qualifications, senior phase qualifications, and Ross Greer asked me if, and I was talking at length about the assessment of qualifications group, and Ross Greer asked me if I had any young people on that group. And, you know, I had that uh, moment where I thought, well, I know what, ans what answer's going to have to be given here, and it's not going to sound very good, which is none. It's <coughs> ridiculous. So th there's the kind of blunt, there's the moment a government minister hits the blunt reality that 
we're sitting there talking about qualifications, and we, you know, I, don't, I don't know what the youngest person in the room would be, but I'd be surprised if there were any younger than 30, I would think, um, in the room. So, I'm amending that. Now, that's the bad, that's the bad example. The better examples are our engagement with organisations like Young Scott, who have very, very, and, and Young Scott are just one um, organisation, <coughs> but they have very, very good mechanisms in a relaxed, participative way of establishing the issues that we need to confront with young people and to draw on their experience to shape policy. So during the governance review, I enlisted the help of Young Scott and Children in Scotland to undertake some of that dialogue with, with young people, and we're doing that increasingly within government. The First Minister uh, convened a, a meeting of the Cabinet with representatives of the Children's Parliament and the Scottish Youth Parliament, and that was, you know, it was around the, the Cabinet table. It, was a, it, it, might have, it might have been viewed to be a, a rather daunting experience for the young people. I think it was actually the other way around. <laughs> For the ministers that were involved in it, so we've 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 got to we have to capture that sentiment that lies at the heart of Mr. Cole Hamilton's question, because if we don't, we will not be capturing the reality of what young people are experiencing. Now, if I look at how my working life has changed in the last five years because of digital technology and put that into the space of how young people's lives are being formed by digital technology alone, there is a need for us to better understand all of these issues and to make sure that our guidance and our approaches adequately tackles those issues. So I'd give the committee an assurance that we are now much more mindful and much more active in how we enlist that input from young people. Well, that's, uh, that's gratifying to hear. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I mean, that very much speaks to the rights that children should enjoy under Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in terms of hearing uh, the voice of the child in decisions which affect them. Um, I think it, it's a slippery fish, and, and I'm sure every, governments of all hues struggle with this in terms of how best to engage young people in decisions that affect them. And I think I'm reminded that criticisms, I think, were fairly levelled at the recruitment of the the new uh, children's commissioner in the sense there was no real uh, panel session in which children could be part of that interview process. Uh, I think that's something we should reflect on. That said, I think this government does do engagement with children and young people very well in other areas. Well, is there a mechanism or a policy or, or um, process that we could better adopt at every level of government in Scotland, either in Parliament or across the government directorates, which can just nail that down? Is there something that we're not doing that could ensure that we don't have gaps like with the recruitment of the Children's Commissioner? Obviously, the, 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 on that issue, it would be wrong for me to, 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 to transgress into that as a parliamentary appointment and, um, and, and the government's not involved in that process. But for our part in the government, I think the examples that I, cite, uh, in, that I cited in my earlier answer are an indication of the fact that we acknowledge that uh, our existing practice has not been good enough in, in, in interacting and engaging with young people. You know, a standard government consultation um, on all these glossy documents that we produce are, you know, it's just, it's just not going to engage young people whatsoever. But some of the interactive sessions that Young Scott and other organisations are able to facilitate for us does give us very, very rich evidence of issues that we need to address. And I certainly, what, so that practice is now becoming much more commonplace within government. Um, and our um, sharing of good professional practice within the civil service is designed to make sure that is more widely taken forward as essentially a habitual part of the, uh, of the, of the approach that we take. But, we, but it's just the fact that we're doing some of that work just now shouldn't be the end of the journey. There will be other aspects that we need to consider to make sure that we get this right. And if I may convene with one final point, and, and at this point I should remind my colleagues of my Register of Interest, having been a former convener of the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights, but um, you, you mentioned in a previous answer, Cabinet Secretary, that 
children should have the right to raise their concerns and have those concerns addressed at, at every level, whatever they may be. Again, that speaks to Article 12, it speaks to several other articles in the UNCRC. The only mechanism that we really have to uh, recognise the UNCRC in Scots law is in part one of the Children and Young People Act, um, which really only puts a duty on ministers to uh, raise awareness of the UNCRC. Um, there are elements of Scottish society that believe that's not enough, that that denies children access to justice in respect of violations of their rights and when when they encounter problems. Do you uh, do you see us changing that any time soon? Do you think that having given, the, what, three years now since um, the Children and Young People Act came into force, um, that, we, that that's enough? Or do you think we need to, to maybe consider in forthcoming children and young people legislation um, enhancing that, perhaps bringing it in line with Wales or, or other European countries in respect, perhaps even a full incorporation of the UNCRC? Well, there's two, po two points I'd make in response to that question. The first is that obviously we have a, a, an ongoing process of assessing um, our position in relation to the UNCRC. And that is a very detailed exercise within government. It's a comprehensive approach within government and the issues that are raised with us by the UNCRC are, are, are issues that we consider and will have to consider. So I suppose the, the, the answer to Mr Cole Hamilton's question is that we, we must view that as, uh, as work in progress, that there, are, that there will be issues that we continue to, to have to address um, and obviously we will advise Parliament about any steps that we intend to take to change policy in that respect. The second point in relation to children's rights is that, of course, there, are, there is the Facility for Children's Rights Impact Assessments on all new policies. And that's a really important part, and I suppose it gives institutionally a, a role and a structure to the type of dialogue I was talking about, which might be facilitated involving young people with young Scott, is to ensure that systemically we are looking at the issues that matter in relation to the position and the perspective of young people and reflecting that in the um, in the approach that we take to the delivery of policy. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, can I pick up on a point in Alec Cole Hamilton's question about uh, the law? And then one piece of evidence that we heard last week from Hannah Brisbane and Susie McGuinness, who are youth advocates at Girl Guides, was about how the law is implemented in schools. And they gave us some quite horrifying examples of sexual assault and issues around consent, um, not just in the upper school now, but affecting younger school pupils, uh, and specifically, uh, in a lot of cases, young women from the age, age of 12 in schools. And it seemed to be that there was not an understanding within the schools of what is criminal behaviour. Mm -hmm. And there seemed to be a question that if you were under 16 and you had you know, there was one example of a young woman who had been sexually assaulted, it had been videoed, it had been passed about on stream, so it's not just Facebook anymore, that's old hat to kids, it's, it's a stream, uh, a Snapchat and stuff like that. And there seemed to be questions from the adults within that, that whether that young woman had given consent or not. Now, she was under 16, so as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. there is no issue about consent, she couldn't give consent, but there seemed to be a clear, um, in th those cases, clear um, evidence that, that teachers and other adults within that whole system didn't understand that that was actually criminal behaviour and they had a responsibility um, to take forward that under child protection procedures and, and criminal law procedures. Um, I don't think your strategy would go into that, that detail, but uh, if it does and, and if you're minded to, would that be something that we could uh, seriously impress on the adults within you know, those relationships that when something is criminal or a child protection issue, that they've got a duty and a, a duty of care and a responsibility to take that forward? I can't um, conceive of circumstances in which it would be justifiable for these issues not to be reported to the police. And it's not, it's not, um, it's not a matter for a teacher or for me to determine what's criminal or not. That's a matter for the police and the procurator fiscal to determine that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I, I just I, and now the issues I'll explore the examples that you raise with me, convener. But I all of these issues 
should be adequately covered by the knowledge and expertise that we would expect in every school in relation to child protection. And these are these are not. Um, I don't think these are these are in any way specialist issues that you raise with me. They are absolutely mainstream issues about child protection. Uh, so therefore, the idea that somehow there is not a proper route for these to be considered, I, I, I totally, you know, procedurally, I reject that argument completely because the, the procedures are crystal clear. Yeah. The child protection regime is crystal clear. Um, we invited uh, Mr. Macdonald and I invited Catherine Dyer to review our child protection arrangements and um, a former Crown agent who has looked at our, our, our arrangements <coughs> and, has, um, and has given us strong reassurance about the strength of those arrangements. Obviously, we must continue to make sure that remains the case, but, um, but we Th those arrangements are strong, clear, robust, and obviously the role of the police and the procurator fiscal service in pursuing issues um, of uh, a criminal nature in general and sexual assault in particular mm -hmm. are huge priorities for the police service and also for Police Scotland and also for uh, the Lord Advocate and the Crown. So I I really can't see any aspect of that area of policy where there isn't crystal clear okay. direction about what should be done in these circumstances. Okay, thank, thank you for that, that, that clarity. David Thomas. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. Um, we've heard the role that heard teachers, um, teachers and staff play in the education environment. What role do third, outside third agencies play? Um, because there is examples of some of the high schools who have full-time counsellors and other agencies and have real success with the mental health and the well-being of pupils. So how do we expand that across the education system? It, it, certainly the, the opportunity is there for third sector organisations to be participants within our schools. And uh, there are many good programmes where schools have reached out to third sector organisations to establish partnerships that enable that to be undertaken. The reforms that I've put in place around pupil equity funding essentially are opening up the possibility of more flexibility being deployed by head teachers and by staff to enlist third sector organisations to make a contribution to the life of the school. And the proposals that I announced last Thursday to Parliament including the emphasis on the head teachers charter and the creation of more flexibility for head teachers create further opportunities for that to be the case so i think there are many good existing examples of how those type of services can be enlisted into schools and the policy reforms that i've put forward are designed to help that further there is of course the review of pse which is undertaken just now which will be which will have an effect in some of these areas that may assist us in the development of further policy. Um, Mary Fee, Thank supplementary. <laughs> well, it's a kind of supplementary to your question. So Go for it. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, the, the convener has, has, has touched on um, a couple of the issues that, that, that I wanted to explore in, in relation to the recording and sharing of, of sexual assaults. And some of the evidence that we heard last week from the, the, the Guiding um, Association, um, to be frank, I found quite horrifying that, that things like that were going on in, in our schools and it would appear almost on a, a, a weekly basis. And we had one of the, the, the young women telling us that when she went to her school to report something, she was told that boys will be boys and it wouldn't be recorded. And I think it's, it's the recording of incidents that's of, of crucial importance here. Um, how those incidents are, are reported. Every single incident, in, in my view, should be reported. No matter how small it is, every single incident should be reported. And I, and I suppose I, I can understand from a school's perspective um, there may take a view, if we record all of this, um, our school will be viewed in a particular light. So how do we move away from, if a school re reports something, ask for perhaps help in dealing with something, acknowledges that they have an issue, that a light will not be shone in that school to say you're doing something wrong, but a light will be shone to say actually you're doing something right because you've recognised a problem 
and you're going to deal with it. So how do we support schools to make sure that things are properly recorded? I think that's perhaps one of the many $64 million questions <laughs> with which I wrestle, um, because I think it, I think it captures the, 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 the dilemma. You know, I, 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 as, I, as I told Parliament last week, I, I don't control the media. Mm. Um, but obviously the, um, the, the circumstances that Mary Fee narrates um, could be ill-construed. Mm -hmm. They could either be construed as, you know, look at how robust this school is mm -hmm. at tackling the issue of bullying, or they could be pursued, pursued, per, uh, portrayed as, look at the awful record yeah. of bullying that exists in this school. And we all live in the real world, yes. but we know that those, that, you know, it is mm -hmm. much more likely to be, uh, look mm -hmm. at the awful record of bullying in these schools. So I think that, that, that that's some of the, these are some of the dilemmas we have to wrestle with about recording. Mm -hmm. And uh, my comments to Mr Balfour's question are designed to address some of those dilemmas. I do want, however, to refer, however, to the question of reporting, because it does follow on from this circumstance the convener raised with me and the example mm -hmm. you cite from the Girl Guides. There are no circumstances. If an incident mm -hmm. is of the substance that has been raised with me this morning, mm -hmm. that, that should not be reported. None. And the child protection arrangements and our criminal framework as a society are crystal clear on this, that these issues should be reported and reported to the proper authorities. Mm -hmm. But that is different, I think, to whether or not we should be recording mm -hmm. every um, incident that might be construed as bullying, which you know we have to work through all the issues mm -hmm. about what does that say about reputation, what does it mm -hmm. say? What does it do for bureaucracy? I'm trying to strip bureaucracy out of our schools. What does that mm -hmm. do about that? But you know, equally, I want to make sure young people feel safe and that they've got the opportunity to to have their mm -hmm. concerns addressed whenever they they, they they have them. So I think there are there are dilemmas in this area. But fundamentally, for me, if there is an issue about um, a an incident being of that nature, it must be reported and reported properly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Okay, th thanks very much. Uh, Gail Ross. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, we um, have had a number of recommendations for the strategy from the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights. And I just wanted to get on the record one in particular. We um, also, through our other inquiry into destitution that we were doing before, heard quite a lot from um, asylum seekers and refugees, and they've also mentioned gypsy travellers in one of the recommendations as well. And they just asked that the addition of one line, um, such as some bullying behaviour against these groups may be of a racist nature, which can have equality law and hate crime implications, although care should be taken to ensure clarity that only some incidents would be racist. Um, I just want some reassurance that you will look at these recommendations. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very happy to do so. Um, as I've indicated to the committee already, I've um, deliberately held off finalising the strategy so that I can hear the committee's views, so obviously the committee's reflections will be important in helping me to come to the conclusions I've got to, to come to. But I think I would also say that it's important that we have um, very clear, broad and low levels of tolerance of anything that might resemble prejudice-based bullying. And um, it's important that we construct the strategy on that basis. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, I've got two quick things that the clerks are reminding me we need to ensure that we have some comment on. One is around uh, the, the issue around uh, resourcing um, and whether that's resources within schools or resources for teachers in order to attend CPD. Now, one of the aspects that we've been looking at quite clearly in the committee is if, if you engage early intervention, which means early spend, uh, that saves a lot of money out of the system uh, later. And if we take the example of the, the, the young woman we spoke to on Tuesday um, and the impact that that's had on her young life, she's 22 now, and the impact that's had on her life and the services and the, the, the interventions that she has needed in order to cope with the, with the outcome. Um, so one of the things that we are quite clearly looking at is the economic impact actually of preventative spend and early spend. 
and whether that's something that will reckon in your deliberations that if you you know you spend I think the old term used to be especially certainly in social work was if you spent a pound on a child at an early stage it saved nine pound out the system at a later stage now I wouldn't like to put a money tag on this because I don't think we should but I think in the reality is that you don't have endless resources so how do we channel those much better at an earlier stage <coughs> in order to save at a later stage well the committee will not be surprised to hear that it will be impossible to get the old finance minister out of me. And, <laughs> um, the, and, and, I, and uh, you know, I, I totally accept the premise of the question. And it's a hallmark of the government's approach about early intervention. Because you know, apart from it being good and the right thing to do, because to take the circumstances that you narrated to me, convener, about the young lady, no young person should be experiencing that difficulty. So the earlier you can address that and intervene and resolve it, the better, because their quality of life will be better, because none of us want to see that being perpetuated. But clearly, the quicker you address that, the more you minimise the risk of long-term, particularly mental health problems mm -hmm. for young people. And that is very, very valuable um, intervention. So the, the whole focus of government policy, whether it's on health, um, on the judicial system in offending, is all about trying to undertake early intervention to avoid more expensive and more pressing demands arising in later years, because that will make the public services unsustainable. So at every level, whether it's about the the right thing to do to give an individual a better quality of life, or enable an individual to have a better quality of life, or to save the long-term cost to the taxpayer, um, the arguments for early intervention are, to me, compelling. Now, how do we do that? Well, when I look at the steps that we're taking through, for example, uh, pupil equity funding, we're putting resources directly into schools, some of which have been used by schools, to establish the very interventions that you're talking about, yeah. about creating more effective pastoral care, because in their judgment, and I think there's sound educational rationale for this, they can sort out some of the issues of personal and pastoral care for young people more effectively than they are just now. The learning potential of those individuals will be enhanced, and that will help us to close the poverty-related attainment gap. Now, it might, that might feel like a circuitous route, but it's a route which I think is well evidenced of being able to improve educational performance by tackling an underlying problem, which is a challenge to that young person. Yeah, there's an organisation in my constituency called Holistic Life who are doing fantastic work in Lark Hall Academy, and the head teacher has used exactly uh, the people equity fund money in yeah. order to do that. And the impact I was in the school last week, and the impact on the young people is it, you, you can't measure it because it, it's staring you in the face. The difference in some pupils who were struggling last year to to not struggling as much this year. But this is this is where we rely on the professional judgment of our educational professionals. Yeah. Because they will, you know, and, and it's, it's why I think we've got to give them the space and the time to work out what are the interventions that will matter. Because in some circumstances, interventions of this nature, I'm not surprised to hear of the route that Lark Hall Academy has taken in this respect, will be in their judgment the ways in which some of the underlying issues that are impediments to the learning capability of young people can be properly addressed. Yeah, yeah, whole, wholeheartedly agree. One last thing, I think it's one last thing, Cabinet Secretary, and we're really grateful for your patience with us, with us this morning. As last week I was in Dublin uh, doing some stuff on gender budgeting, which is uh, another aspect of the work this committee will probably look at as well. But I managed to meet with an organisation called Belong To, who deliver inclusive educations, especially for LGBTI young people within the, the school education system in, in, in Ireland. Um, they have a whole school approach. They have a fantastic school resource pack with a rapid impact assessment that they do. But not only do the teachers do it, but the kids do this assessment as well, so it'd be quite interesting to see the comparison of what teachers say about the school as compared to what young people say about, about the school as well. But they use all of that in order to deliver a, a very, very inclusive education. Now, one of the tensions we had at the beginning of, of this was about faith-based education and the impact of maybe moral education as far as maybe young people 
were struggling with, with sexuality. I would hold up Belong To and the school's approach is a very good example of that. And I'm wondering whether you would look to that example as, as a, maybe a way to move forward. I know we've got the working group, a very gratefully received uh, um, uh, working group. And from talking to the young people that are involved in the working group, they're feeling that that's going to deliver the results. But again, how, how, how did government draw on the, the best examples like the one in Ireland to, you know, maybe not reinvent the wheel, but look at where's, where's the best practice and how can we use that to ensure mm. that we move forward quicker rather than slower? The, the committee will be aware, as you've cited, Kavira, of the establishment of the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group. And I have deliberately um, appointed a broad membership to that group to make sure that we can have all of these issues considered in a in a very dispassionate way and uh, I'm obviously engaging heavily around this particular question. I think it is important that we look at uh, good practice in other, uh, in, in other jurisdictions and that we uh, learn lessons to try to uh, address the issues that we need to address here and to find a way where we can all be comfortable with the approaches that are taken. And that's one of my objectives, is to make sure that we use this process in a fashion that we address the issues of all within this process, but that fundamentally uh, we can take an approach to inclusive education that will address the needs of uh, young people who are in the LGBTI community and that we properly address their perspectives. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I don't think we have... We have not exhausted our topics, Cabinet Secretary, but I think we have exhausted our time. <laughs> Um, we certainly have uh, gathered a huge amount of evidence and we are now uh, going into deliberations now about how we have put that evidence into a report that will be useful for, for all of us in order to move forward. But we are very grateful for your time this morning and your officials' time this morning and very grateful that you allowed us the time to take uh, to do this, uh, this inquiry. I think it will make life a lot better for everyone who is in education, especially the young people that we have been speaking to. So thank you so much. For, for, for my part, Kavita, I've um, appreciated the opportunity to um, have the committee's perspective on these issues, and I think it's a, a, an example of how we can, um, in government, benefit from very clear deliberations on hard issues from committees, and I look forward to receiving the committee's input. And as I indicated in my statement, I, I will not finalise the approach that we take until such time as I've got and considered the committee's report. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to suspend committee now to go to private session. Thank you.